Welcome, everybody, to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Inc. I'm Pete Wright. You're jumping into a conversation in progress with Nakubo President and Chief Executive Officer John Walda. Howard Tybal and I had an opportunity to sit down with John the closing day of Nakubo Annual Meeting 2014 in Seattle. It was a great conversation. If you missed the first episode in this conversation, head back to episode 63, part one, uh, and you'll be all caught up and ready to listen to uh, our, the second half of our conversation with John Walda at Nakubo Annual Meeting 2014 in Seattle, Washington. You know, this whole question about the business model being broken, um, you said earlier there's many different kinds of higher ed, and I think that there's a lot of different perceptions around that idea about is it, does it need to be tweaked, does it need to be fixed, is it really broken, or does it need to be transformed? And, and it depends on which model you're looking at. Uh, yeah. we have, we're launching a new project just approved by our board of directors, uh, and it will uh, take place over two or three years, but uh, we're going to break the higher education industry down into uh, probably six or eight segments, uh, and you know you can guess what they are, mm -hmm. and uh, take a look at what uh, the uh, weak parts are of their business model. Uh, do some writing about that, and then we'll also produce another uh, set of tools which will identify solutions to the parts of the business model which are broken, and then this will all become a toolkit for. Uh, member institutions to use uh, to have the conversation between the different leaders on campus and the trustees about what changes need to be made, what are the solutions, and what works best in the individual institution's setting. All right, so I keep in mind, this is all driven. One another thing we sometimes forget is uh, success can only be measured by your uh, ability to achieve your mission. So. Uh, one of the things I, I like to keep going back to about this business model thing is that the first thing that defines your business model is what your mission is. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to see uh, an institution give up an important mission over a weakness in the business model that supports it. We need to find a way around that. It's a great example of that. Jesuit schools giving up their focus on taking care of people who can't afford to go there. There you go. Yeah, that's a core one. Yeah. So here's a question. I'm curious. Uh, You've been president for how long now? How many years? Eight years. How has it changed for you? How is uh, you're, you're probably pretty comfortable on the job at this point after eight years. Oh, I still feel like a newcomer. <laughs> do you do you really in many ways? In some I mean, in some ways, do you feel like uh, you know like you're always learning? I, I am always learning. If I weren't learning anymore, I wouldn't do the job yeah. anymore because that, that what that's what makes the job fun. But what are you excited about looking forward in this in this uh, in this work for you? Well, I. We started to talk about it earlier. I, uh, and, and perhaps it's because of, of my background, but I, uh, I think it's important for Nakubo to be a public policy leader, and I believe we have become in many ways. Uh, and it used to be that the only things that we, because we represented business officers, would talk about to public policy makers were things like oh, tax policy or policy around endowment management or whatever the strictly business issues were. Uh, because of the, this ex expansive role of the business officer that we've talked about, uh, we're talking about basically everything. So uh, it's, it, it's student financial aid, it's uh, Title IV money, uh, it's all of the provisions of the Higher Education Act because all of these things will impact mm -hmm. our ability to be successful. So I'm, I'm excited about the role we've taken on there, about the amount of uh, recognition and respect we have uh, in agencies of government. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that, that goes along with then providing tools to our members to talk about policy. Yeah, I mean, it's always been since I've, since I've met you and I've listened to you speak and I see you in front of a room, it's, it's obvious to me just how committed and passionate you are about making that kind of impact in the public policy arena. And um, what's really great, I can tell you, just watching you is your level of optimism. Because I think optimism really is a critical thing. Yes. If we don't convey optimism or hope, people can very easily fall into all the reasons why we can't do it. 
There's, a, there's an interesting sort of twist on public policy, and you, you said something a little while ago that got me thinking, this, this whole idea that, um, that the business officers as, as sort of this changing leader, uh, their res they have this uh, new responsibility of communicating the value of higher education. Correct. Uh, how, how does that work beyond sort of legislative uh, congressional policy, you know, uh, but to community policy? We're, we're in an era when fewer and fewer people, high school graduates, are saying, I really need a, to go get a degree right now. Uh, I disagree with that. Well, I'm just looking at the, at the, the, you know, when you look at some of the statistics and you're saying that only 20% of the, what, 200 million people enrolled in higher ed in this country are of traditional age. Uh, we have institutions that are really struggling with uh, recruiting uh, and are saying, gosh, I wish we could find a loophole in Title IV funding to be able to use Title IV funds for marketing because, my goodness, we have a lot of people on aid and not enough traditional education revenue. We, we're, we're looking for ways to increase our recruitment in a constrained market. Um, you know, and, and we can take on some of those other issues, but the, the bottom line for me is what is the role of the CBO in helping to educate their local regional community around the value of education and increase the, the value in an era when people are looking for other ways to get educated? Well, when we talk about the advocacy role for our members, uh, we, we talk about it in the large sense that you're describing. It isn't just about talking to members of Congress or mm -hmm. legislators or community leaders. It's about talking to the community at large. And, uh, uh, and it's about two things. It's about the value of higher education to individuals, uh, how lives are changed and improved. Uh, in, in, in everything from lifetime income to uh, uh, civic responsibility. Uh, and, and it's also about uh, the, the public good and how higher education contributes to a better society. So we prepare our members to talk about those things with data. Uh, now, uh, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of harm that's been done by people looking at uh, anecdotes about higher education instead of real data. One of them is around uh, not as many students want to go to college anymore. There's no data that says that. Uh, graduates from high school are still going to college at the same rate as they have uh, for the last several decades. There are more students now who are uh, returning students or who are older students. That's, you know, a part of where we are right now. Um, and if you ask uh, through surveys, and I've, I've read these surveys, uh, the general public about what they think about the value of how important it is to go to college, they'll tell you it's more important now than it ever was, and they're right about that. But at the same time, they'll say, but it's too expensive. And incidentally, uh, I don't think our state legislature should spend any more money on it. Mm. So we've got this interesting dichotomy. I think a lot of that is based upon, uh, as I said before, uh, a depiction of higher education by anecdote. So how often is it that you read uh, a national newspaper or see uh, in the Huffington Post or wherever it happens to be uh, a story about uh, a guy who's got $100,000 in student debt, exactly. three degrees and no job? Well, you know, that's... That happens. It's a dime a dozen. That is rare. It, it is very rare. But it's, it, it, and, it makes and, the news. And then you get to people painting with a broad brush things right. about student debt. So what they say is, okay, the average student graduates with $29,000 in debt. No, that's not true. The average student who graduates with debt, debt. Yeah. has yeah, $29,000. Yeah, exactly. But 30%, yeah. 31% of students who graduate with a four-year degree have no debt at all. And, and you know where that came out in, in the Chronicle is the Miseducation of America. That was a and very good article. That was a great article because yes. it responded to what was good about the movie Ivory Tower because I saw that. And there were things about it that really painted the, the right story, but it, it gave out some incorrect information. Right. And that was one of them. So getting back to Nakubo now, uh, what I've seen as our mission is, is to uh, find ways to gather data, synthesize it, and make it available. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, and you mentioned it uh, earlier, Howard. The, uh, 
the new tool that we have to take a look at institutional financial aid, uh, will tell the true story on how much institutions are spending of their own money to provide scholarships for students, and we want to analyze how that's impacting success for students from different walks of life, uh, success measured in terms of not only whether you're uh, you stay through degree, but how you do after you graduate. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important to have that data at hand to be able to talk about that. Absolutely. We're also developing a, a new uh, tool, which we're, we call this the Blank Slate Project. And it asks the question, if you could start over with a financial reporting model that would inform the public about what it costs to provide higher education and... Uh, what the impact is of spending money on different areas like uh, student services, uh, spending it on student financial aid, et cetera, then wouldn't you have more support for the enterprise? And uh, uh, this got Bill Gates' attention, incidentally. He's very interested in this yeah. project because uh, he believes, and he's right, that if you can't tell the story, then somebody else is going to create a solution that doesn't work, probably the government, uh, with regard to what data you should report, and how you're rewarded for different outcomes. I, I want to just make a correction. I feel like I spoke flippantly about that. I, I, my, not my intention. I really was referring to the uh, this idea of the changing demographic of, of students, and sure. that was from the AASCU uh, Policy Matters brief. Uh, yes, and, and of so, course, that varies by yeah, where you are in this country. truly does. If you're in the Midwest, uh, they're projecting a 7% decline in uh, high school graduates. Uh, if you're in Texas uh, or California, there will continue to be growth, but it's a different student with a different background. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's one of the things that's most actually exciting. And I wonder, I mean, is this a little ray of hope that one of the things that we're seeing as we get more engaged leaders, that we have more engaged institutions that create more engaging opportunities for more different kinds of people. This whole right. idea of a lifelong learner is a great opportunity for institutions that have programs ready for them. Sure is. So actually, I, I want to ask, I think this is quick, uh, but it's basically something <laughs> probably that... Probably not. I, probably not. <laughs> that this, this Something that I wonder is left, whether it's left the gestation or not, and that is I had a conversation over dinner last night with some CBOs about there was a time when I was much younger where I knew people who grew up who, and maybe more, even more my parents' age, um, that the college education wasn't a requirement to be able to be a productive adult citizen and make it in the world. And there's a part of me that says, have we really, is that basically left the station? That really, because in the media, the story is, and, and there's evidence and there's, there's data that suggests how much, you know, your, your gross earnings, and, all that's, and I think it's all valid. And there's a part of me that looks at people who sort of the fear and parents saying, well, you've got to go to college otherwise, and then they take on this huge amount of financial aid. Um, sometimes it almost feels like predatory lending. Whether or not there is still a place for not going to college, and I'm not talking about dropping out and being part of the not college movement, but alternatives to college that are just as valid. And it feels like there was a time where that was the case, but that conversation even doesn't feel like it's present anymore. I, I, I don't think it is present anymore, and, and Howard, I don't think it's present because I, don't, I think it's true that in this economy, the economy of the future, you have to have a degree. Uh, and eventually you're going to have to have a master's, and eventually after that you're going to have to have a PhD. You know, the question is, are we going from high school, and then that was sufficient, to an undergraduate, and then that was sufficient, and then a master's, because an right. undergraduate is not going to be sufficient. Is that where this is going? Well, when you look at the, the, the jobs that are projected to be available in the economy, it, it tells the story. Uh, and the story is that uh, the, the jobs that were available and made it possible to live a middle-class life when... I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, were all manufacturing type jobs. They paid well, and uh, there was uh, a good lifestyle attached to that. Manufacturing jobs are on the decline in this country. Uh, we're now uh, an economy that focuses on service 
and uh, high tech and uh, professions and you know those things all require more education. I think that the last data I saw indicated that uh, by the year 20, I think 16, some 73 percent of the jobs in this country will require a degree, mm. and it was back in the 40 percent range. Uh, right a couple of decades ago. There's an interesting connection to the increase in the number of uh, HR built positions requiring a degree and uh, any sort of job retrenchment or recession, economic recession, uh, because when you have large numbers of people laid off uh, and a large body of people looking for work, uh, the bar is raised incrementally. And so you have these leaps. Yes. Uh, and, and many, many people go back to school during these. Well, what's interesting for, in, for schools is that yeah. in the growing the institutions where they add more and more programs and services, and the student experience world. I think the institutions have, in many cases, box themselves in. And the challenge is, that I see is, how they step back to what is our core offering? You know, what is it that we can do exceptionally well and attract that kind of student? And in some cases, you know, there's a number of institutions, everything is not $50,000. Right. You can get a great education, but you have to know what you're going for, or you have to be educated that it's out there but, and you don't have to go into that kind of debt. And I think that there, there's that and misinformation out there today, too. That parents are generically convinced that it's out of reach, which, which I think that we're not doing a good enough story, uh, or the media, too, telling how there are different segments that you can enter into, and you don't have to uh, incur that kind of debt. That's very true. I think we solved all the problems. Do you, right? do you think so? Are we finished? Yeah, no, we just I mean, got Kuba, started. I mean, are you going to wrap up now that we've uh, solved all our problems? Yeah. This is the last well, annual meeting. John's got, John and goes on. I guess the I next won't thing. have to work much longer. That's now right. That we solved all the problems. This yeah, is our retirement episode for yeah, Nakuba. I don't think can so. I, can I just close up with one question? If you look at what's coming up for the uh, for this coming year's agenda, leading to next year's annual meeting, what are you most excited about, John? Well, there's a there, uh, of course, the the continued development of. Uh, the, of the business model as I described it before and, and looking at uh, uh, new sources of revenue and new ways to constrain cost is, will continue to evolve and I'm very engaged in that and excited about it. I do think that a uh, large part of our focus as an association and mine as an individual will have to be on what's going on in the legislative and regulatory world. Uh, we can predict that once this year's elections are over, uh, Focus will turn to uh, the Higher Education Act reauthorization. There are lots of interesting new ideas out there about what should go into that legislation. Some of them really good, some of them really bad. Mm. Uh, and uh, and then you've got a lot of regulatory things that are going on, which really uh, people don't understand how impactful uh, regulation is on campuses in terms of having to gear up to produce the reports and get the people to do that and the way it affects campus life. So uh, we'll, we'll be in there trying to uh, uh, give some uh, rationality to the process of developing regulations around campus safety, uh, around uh, banking services for students, just to pick a, you know, a couple of hot topics. Well, this is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's wonderful and, and I think a sign of that changing trend uh, of the role of the business officer to see uh, you involved in so many of these initiatives around campuses that are that it, you, we're, we're watching such a shift. It's a it's a real pleasure to at least be involved in that conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, John Wall, the president. You're welcome, my pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Howard. Do we have anything else for the people this week? No, I, I'm just I'm just thrilled and very thankful that John uh, one that I have the opportunity both to learn from you and to uh, find ways to partner with the Kubo in this work. It's really been an incredible journey for me and a growth journey for me um, as an external provider to be able to help. And I, I look forward to continuing uh, my relationship with the Kubo. We do too. That's great. Thank you, everybody, for listening. To learn more about the show, head over to tybalink.com. You can subscribe to the show for free in iTunes. We encourage you to do that. And make sure you reach out to us on Twitter. You can find Howard Tybel at Howard Tybel on Twitter. I'm at Pete Wright. We'd love your questions and suggestions and encourage you to start a dialogue with us there. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. On behalf of John Walda and Howard Teibel, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week 
on Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Inc.